Hello, everyone. This is Ben Kelly with the Endeavoring Orthodoxy podcast. Uh, today, I want to talk about a few things, uh, just uh, get some things off my chest. Um, and uh, so those things, uh, we're going to talk about the overturning of Roe and how great that is as Christians. We should be celebrating that. Uh, talk about how uh, I'm really disappointed in the lack of enthusiastic celebration from different Christians on this issue and um, how some Christians or supposed quote unquote Christians are just outright coming out and saying this is a bad thing, which is disturbing. And then um, I also want to just talk about some books I've read in the first half of this year. So uh, buckle up. Let's uh, I'm, I don't have this scripted or anything. I'm so fired up right now. I'm just going into this blind. So if I'm a little all over the place, uh, that's why. So, but uh, as you all know, uh, Roe was overturned. Uh, I'm sure your social media feeds are just blowing up um, with people who are angry or people who are celebrating and whatnot. I got to say, I am, I- I'm really just disappointed, heartbroken. Uh, confused, Uh, maybe even, I don't know what the best word to say, jaded a little bit, Uh, that I don't see the Christian response that I thought I would see out of this. I I was was texting back and forth with some friends today, and um, they were telling me the same kind of thing. They're kind of outright angry because they have Members in their own churches who are saying this is a bad thing. Christians shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be trying to deny people abortion. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, we shouldn't be protecting innocent life. What's all this? What's all this social movement stuff that so many young Christians were into two years ago with protecting? innocent life and fighting for justice. Where's all that now? I I don't get it. Like are are the unborn not people in their eyes? Are they not important? Well, we know what they are for those who propose this stuff, for those who want to see it go through. We know that they think it's just a clump of cells or it's not a person, there is no life there. We know what, even though that's so scientifically been disproven, and even people who are pro-abortion coming out and they are admitting it's murder, and they're okay with that. But Christians, what are you doing? You're not, you're not excited about this? You're not, <laughs> you think it's a bad thing? And, you know, I just, um, I'm wrapping up a course right now in contemporary theology. Um, so it's, it's modern theology and contemporary thought. And you know what? I just, as someone who has studied the history of the church, you see this time and time again, where the people, you, you see those who want to go the way of the world. And, and that's, how this is turning out right now. You're seeing a lot of people, they think they're doing the right thing. They're they're thinking they do what Jesus wants them to do by being empathetic with the people who want to murder children. No, no. There is right and wrong. It is wrong to murder children in the womb. I'm sorry. That's how it is. Now, should the church be taking care of those people who are thinking about having these abortions? You're darn straight they should. The church should be leading in adoption. One of the, one of the biggest things that grinds my gears about the church in the suburbs is that it's a little more conservative, and I have no qualms with that necessarily. I don't, 
I, I really try to keep politics out of it. Um, I don't see myself as liberal or conservative in my political views. I, I don't really even have many political views anymore. I, I did 10 years ago, but I just don't see as much importance with it now. Uh, but one of the biggest things that grinds my gears about the evangelical church, especially in the suburbs, it's a little more conservative, which I fits my temperament a little bit more. Uh, I can accept some of the things that are said there a little more. But they don't lead in adoption. They don't lead in really valuing life at that level. They'll say, oh, life is important. It begins in the womb. We need to fight of abortion. All true things. But then they don't step up and do something about it. And so the younger generations of Christians who are all living in the city, who are all more progressive, they see those older generations not doing what they are called to do. They're not taking care of the orphan or the widow, as James calls them to do. And so the younger generations of quote-unquote Christians, they're, they're picking up these liberal politics these, well, they're, I wouldn't even say they're liberal, they're progressive politics, they're picking those up, and then they're not, and they're doing that because the older generations are not doing what they're called to do in the church. And so these younger generations, they are developing really backwards theology. They're developing an orthopraxy based on what the world thinks, and it's and that really that doesn't make it an orthopraxy, that makes it a you know, a, um, I don't know what you would call that, but it's just a wrong kind of practice because it's not theologically founded. You know, at least the older generations, the, the, the more conservative, um, you know, evangelical church out in the suburbs, they might have a right orthodoxy. They might have a right doctrine, but they're not doing the right practices. And so then you've got younger generations who hate their politics. And because of that, they identify with the politics of the world. And then they pick up, they think they're doing what's right practice, and it's not. We need to figure this out. We need, we need to do something about this. We can't just have right beliefs. We have to do something, too. And so I, I'm just, I'm really frustrated that... I see so many young people in my generation not celebrating this. They think it's they think it's wrong, you know, and then they go and they celebrate these politicians who are just have no biblical worldview whatsoever, but but they're being nice. And that's what Jesus would want. No. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man should come into the Father except through me. The gospel has some hard truths. That we have to accept to believe it. There, there's no skirting around that. And not murdering people is one of those. We can't uphold that as a norm. So that's just I'm not I'm gonna I'm not gonna rant about that anymore. That's just it's just really bothering me. And I know it's bothering some other people too. They're just not seeing, not seeing it. And, and you look in your churches and you wonder, what is going on here? How are these people being taught? What are they being taught? I mean, I, mean, I know what they're being taught. They're being taught to think with their emotions. They're not, they're not being taught to logically think about the gospel, to think that there's rationality behind what God has revealed to us and how, we sh it, how it should order our lives. No. You just do what you feel is best. You meet God through your feelings. Barf. Give me a break. I'm so done with that kind of Christianity. And you know what? If I, if I become anything of a writer, of a speaker, of a pastor, of a scholar, I vow to make it my lifelong warpath to fight against that kind of garbage theology that that somehow God is mediated through our emotions not that our emotions aren't important we are emotional beings 
we experience mo- emotion. We are not robots, but I will not stand any longer with pastors and theologians who are teaching this kind of stuff that says God meets us or is mediated through our emotions because what it is, it's a complete backwards theology and it constructs God based on how we feel rather than going to his divine revelation and seeking who he is. And I'm just, I'm done with that. So I, you know what, I will, you can hold me to it. It, You know, the, the whole 30, 40 people who listen to this, if I make it anywhere, I am fighting against that, and that is my goal. I, I know more about it than most people um, that you'll ever meet um, as far as re- the doctrine of revelation and how God's um, word comes to us. I've read the historical stuff on it. But I'm just so sick of hearing about what people think about who God is. God told us who he is. Go look it up. There, it. You can understand it. It's propositionally there. It's cognitively there. You can understand it. You don't have to feel your way to God. He has told you who he is and what must be done to come back to him. But we, but our generation just plays around with this stuff, and it's, it's going to burn us. Tell you what, it's, it's going to burn us so bad. So that was the that's the the kind of the first thing I wanted to talk about as far as this road decision goes. I'm I'm excited. I'm happy. But again, it's, I just I just opened up Facebook and I'm reading this this thing. If a church spends more on its worship band than the local crisis pregnancy center, they need to re-examine their priorities. And this so-called Christian on here, um, just people just don't know how to argue. People just don't know how to reason about this stuff. What you're doing during worship fuels what you do out in the world. If we, if we, if we twist the gospel into this thing where we have to be serving all the time, we've got it backwards. Because we think we get to God through our service. We think we get to God through our works. Not through Christ. It just just baffles me. It just baffles me. So, anyways, that's the first thing I want to talk about. I also want to talk about, I I came across this argument, you know, that... um, and you, you, you'll hear many different versions of this, I'm sure. But, you know, if if people who are fighting to overturn abortion, overturning Roe, would work as hard as doing this one other thing, then they would really be pro-life. They would really, you know, be the church. And it's like, wait a minute. Those are not the same thing. So I had I had one friend comment to me that, you know, I think those fighting to overturn Roe for for decades, but ignoring the high infant mortality rates and maternal rates is a problem. I would rather see our leaders figure out how to prevent deaths to mothers and children already being born first before we add more to the system. And I just like, what? What what kind of argument is that? And I I told him, like, these are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. But you'll have these people who craft these arguments that are trying to get the moral high ground on you. And they're they're trying to devalue what you're doing if you are fighting against abortion. And it's it's crazy. And so I uh I I told I told this person, I'm going to read what I wrote to this person. I'm not going to tell you who it is because you don't need to know. Um, I consider this person a friend. I respect this person, but it's not important who it is. Um, I wrote to him, I respectfully disagree on the basis that the issue you are discussing has nothing to do with abortion. It honestly seems more like a deflection to depreciate the moral status of pro-life people as if they are not doing enough when they say, 
they want to stop abortion. This can be done so that those who oppose pro-lifers can seemingly gain the moral high ground, but these issues are false equivalences. Life, by almost all theological and philosophical accounts, is an absolute or natural right which no person has the right to take away. Those who do not agree with this assessment typically unravel because their philosophical worldview does not remain cogent. Healthcare, on the other hand, if it is a right at all, which I do not believe it is, is only a right granted by the state in the last 15 or so years. They are not the same thing. The moral obligations of the two circumstances are different as well. Do I have a moral obligation as a Christian to oppose the slaughtering of a defenseless class of people? I believe I do. On the other hand, do I have a moral obligation to provide funding and work towards a healthcare system that is working to prevent something that does not always happen? That is a more difficult question. I am not saying your issue is not important, but it is not the same thing. Further, the type of evil, theologically and philosophically speaking, but between abortion and unfortunate death of child and mother during birth are completely different. The death of child or mother during labor is what theologians and philosophers have classically defined as natural evil. It is evil that occurs in the world, not as a direct consequence of our actions. As a Christian, I am prone to say this kind of evil happens because of sin in the world, even though mother and child may have not directly caused it. God cursed childbirth in Genesis 3. It is an unfortunate result of living in a sinful world. On the other hand, abortion is a sinful human evil caused by direct action of humans. A conscious choice is made to end a life. This is not a natural evil. This is different. I believe Christians have a moral obligation to work so that there is no choice to end a life like an abortion. I do not believe equating these two issues is an honest argument and is a false equivalence, especially since one is brought about by unfortunate but natural evil occurrences and that um, excuse me by unfortunate but natural occurrences and the other is a direct act of evil if you want to win this argument you need to prove that one is not truly pro-life unless he agrees to fund a government health care system for the purpose of protecting mothers and children that may die during labor that may be difficult what if the system is corrupt what if it is mismanaged it, is already, it has already been demonstrated that these two issues are not morally the same. So it's just, I'm so tired of hearing this kind of thing. Like, do people, no, they don't. I, I'm already answering. I was going to say, do people think through these things when they post them? No, they don't. They, they think with their emotions. People today think emotionally. They do not think rationally. They think emotionally. They don't want to break this stuff down into categories and really try to work through it. They want to respond to it emotively so that they can try to gain the moral high ground. And there's no virtue in that. There's nothing good that has come about that. It's all directed by social media, and we can all agree that social media has been a huge, just terrible problem on our culture. So. I just, I, I don't know where to go with this. I don't know what to do. I, I, I just, I'm sick of hearing, I'm sick of hearing those kinds of answers from Christians. One where Christians will say, this is wrong. This is flat out wrong. Well, no, it's not. It's not flat out wrong. Never, never in the history of the world has protecting life been wrong. You are wrong. I'm sorry. And you need to face up. And it's not this... Will you have your truth? In it? No, it's not that. It is wrong. And you are wrong for believing it. And But the other one where Christians who, I, I think they're really guided more by their, their political presuppositions and, and they want to remain progressive. They know abortion is wrong, but yeah, but, yeah, but Christians aren't doing enough. It's like, get off your moral high horse. Let's see you do something. If you're so adamant, if you're so, if you are so much more pro life than I am, please lead by example and tell me how to do this. I would love to see that happen. But guess what? They're not. 
They're not. So that's my soapbox for that um, today. I just, I, I'm really, I'm fed up by it. I've, I've had enough thinking of getting off social media for good on this. So anyways, so th- I wanted to transition a little bit. I had the idea of talking about books that um, I've read in the first six months of the year. And um, I just, I, you know, I got into some conversations online that uh, I, I just wanted to get that off my chest about this whole row being overturned thing. And so uh, I hope that wasn't too emotional. That was not my plan. That was Ben Kelly unscripted here. So uh, this part isn't scripted as either, but I, I'm going through the books that I've read in the first half of the year. And I just want to talk a little bit about some of the good stuff that I've read. Now, granted, most of this stuff is because I've been in school and uh, I just, uh, some of it may be, if you're not an avid reader, um, especially in like philosophy or theology, maybe over your head. I don't know. I can't. I thought about doing, you know, the top five books, but then I was like, there are so many good books here. I don't want to not mention some. Um, then I thought about doing a top 10. I was like, well, you know, I've read 25 books so far this year, and I don't think I could just pick 10 that I think are great. So I'm going to go through my list here. I've, I've got a Goodreads account. Um, so if, if you want to follow me on Goodreads, uh, my name, you can follow me. My name is Benjamin Kelly. And you can follow me on there. You can my picture for the account is the exact same logo for the podcast. And so, if you want to find me, uh, just look up Benjamin Kelly and look for the podcast logo. Logo there, I am. You can follow what I'm reading from week to week. So, uh, to start off the year, uh, let's see. I read a book called Holy Scripture by. Um, a theologian named John B. Webster. Um, Webster is dead now. Uh, he died in the early 2000s. I want to say 2006. Don't quote me on that. I don't know that for sure. Uh, great book. It is difficult. Uh, Webster is kind of, if I had to put a title on him, he is a he's an Anglican. He was an Anglican priest and theologian. He was a scholar, um, and he's. He really worked hard to get theology back into the church. Uh, That was his big thing. And his idea was we do theology first and foremost as Christians who are reading the Word of God. And so that is, uh, you can't go wrong reading Webster. Uh, I think had he lived longer, I think he was only like in his mid-50s or in his 60s when he died. So he died fairly young. Had he lived longer, I think we'd be talking about a historic theologian, someone who's going to be remembered for centuries because really worked hard to become one of the top theologians. So um, this is a book I highly recommend if theology is your thing and you want to read more about the doctrine of the Word of God and how to get it back in the church, uh, Holy Scripture by John Webster. Let's see, another book I really liked, Debating Christian Religious Epistemology, um, an introduction of five views of knowledge of God. Um, it's edited by William DePoe. Uh, this is really more for those who have some knowledge in philosophy. If you don't, uh, this book is not for you. You should try something else first. Uh, but if, you've, if you're if you really interested in, well, how do how do people know what God says about himself. How, how is revelation mediated to us? It's five different views presented in this book. It is highly technical. Um, even I was thrown for a loop, you know, thrown for a loop on multiple parts of it and had to go back and read a lot of stuff. Not easy. Uh, but if that is your thing, if, um, especially if you even, you know what epistemology is and you understand that there are different views of it, within the Christian religion, go for it. Um, a book that everyone should read, On the Incarnation by Athanasius. Uh, this is, I think it was like 60 pages. It's, you know, we're talking about the incarnation of Christ here. We're talking about God becoming man. And so uh, Athanasius, possibly 
the greatest Christian theologian ever, you know, behind Paul. Um, and I really don't, you know, Paul's Paul wrote part of the Bible. I don't really count him. As far as non-biblical theologians go, Athanasius, maybe the greatest, maybe it's Augustine. Uh, Athanasius might be a little more important based on the heresies he was dealing with. This is a great little book. Buy it. Read it. It's like five bucks on Amazon. Let Athanasius just teach you and let it build up your soul. Um, talking about the importance of God becoming man and what that means for us on the Incarnation by Athanasius. Read it. Ah, uh, let's see here. I don't want to go through all of these. Um, a good one. Very another short one. Natural Law: A Brief Introduction and in Biblical Defense by David Haynes. Um, Haynes is an interesting uh, scholar and writer that has really pumped out some interesting material in the last couple of years. More of a Reformed Calvinistic Christian, but is fighting for what he believes is the Reformed understanding of things like natural theology and natural law. Uh, really goes hard against some of the Presbyterian Reformed uh, apologists and philosophers of the last century who I would agree to some extent had wrong beliefs about the role of natural theology and in the church. Um, I do believe Haynes gives a more fair reading of guys like Calvin and Luther. So natural law, a brief introduction in biblical defense, David Haynes, check it out. It's only like a hundred pages. You, you can kill it. It's great. Let's see. Um, an introduction to biblical ethics, Walking in the Way of Wisdom, Robertson McQuilkin. Great book. Uh, I can't say enough about it. Lots of ethical issues and what the Bible says about them. You will not be, it's a, it's a great book to have on your shelf to um, use to explore different ethical issues and give you an idea of kind of the arguments that are happening within those issues and then to give you a starting place where you could research further into certain issues. Great book. Highly recommend it. Let's see. Um, the Gospel in the Marketplace of Ideas, Paul's Mars Hill Experience of Our Pluralistic World by Paul Copen. Again, this is a book that really is tied up. Paul Copen does not share some of the same theological ideas I do, but it, this is a great book really looking at, and he's, he's talking about um, Paul and Acts going to Mars Hill. I also think he talks about Paul at the, uh, I can't remember which one's Mars Hill, if that's Acts 14 or Acts 17 or, or why not, but he's talking about these experiences and acts that Paul had and what that means for how we do public theology, how we present our theology in the public places of society, how we dialogue with non-Christians. Great book written at a very comprehensible level. The Gospel in the Marketplace of Ideas, Paul Copen. Can't go wrong. Um, let's see here. Another one that I really liked. It is, uh, let's see, God and Moral Obligation by C. Stephen Evans. Um, this is a philosophy book. It is not easy to read. It is difficult. But it, it's so good. So if, if you are into understanding Christian ethics um, and what, what Christians are morally obligated to do and exploring what that means, this is a great book. It's not long. I think it's under 200 pages, not too long. Um, I, I loved it. I read it. It's not easy. So pace yourself. You may have to read things multiple times. That's okay. You know. That's part of growing as a Christian. You have to work through things that are just difficult to work through. Uh, let's see. Paul's Spirituality in Galatians, a Critique of Contemporary Christian Spiritualities. P. Adam McClendon. Uh, I, I like what um, McClendon writes in his books. He's really looking hard at what does it mean from a biblical perspective. In, in, this, in this case, Galatians to have Christian spirituality. 
if you can get your if you can get a hold of this book, it's it's worth your weight in gold, They're worth your weight, um, not its weight, your weight in gold. So I I, I chose those words specifically. Don't think that I'm um, messing up there. It is it's a great book and it's very comprehensive. It, you can anybody can read it. I I think so that and maybe I judge that that aspect too lightly, but it's it's very approachable. Uh, another one, Natural Theology, a Biblical and Historical Introduction in Defense, David Haynes. I talked about Haynes earlier with the book on natural law. He also wrote a book on natural theology. And he, what he does in this, if he really challenges the presuppositional apologetics of a guy like Cornelius Van Til. And uh, I've never been a huge Van Til fan myself, but I am a bit of a presuppositionalist, so I was interested to listen to these arguments. And wow, it, it, this book does not disappoint. Natural Theology, David Haynes, it's a great book. I, I learned about it from uh, Kevin DeYoung, who is you know, a Reformed Presbyterian, very conservative, and he's the one who recommended it on his podcast. So I immediately picked it up. It's a couple years old, but man, it was a good book. Um, another book, and this, if you can get your hands on it, this is, this is the, that's the question for this book. General Revelation, Historical Views and Contemporary Issues by Bruce Damaris. This book, I believe, was written in 1982. It is out of print. I had to go and find a hard copy of the book for like 10 bucks on Amazon. Uh, this book has been quoted many, many times in some of the literature I've read. It is amazing. I don't know why it's not in print. It's such a good historical overview of what the church's view of general revelation has been. And he tries to give a biblical idea of what is the true doctrine of general revelation and where some, some theologians and scholars have erred previously. I love this book. I use it all the time. And refer I just wrote a paper. I used it to reference in. Um, I referenced it in my um, modern theology class many times. I loved reading it. It took a while to read. It's not an. It's it's not a hard read. It's just. It's it's um very factual. It's very data driven. So you you have to chug through it piece by piece. It's not something you can just read for pleasure. Uh, but man, it, it is a useful book. Let's see here. A couple books, maybe for just perspective and benefit. Um, Evangelical Theology: An Introduction by Karl Barth. I, I'm. I want people to be aware that I do not endorse everything that Karl Barth says. In fact, I think he's quite heretical in some of the things he says. I, um, his doctrine of revelation. Um, just for a brief explanation of it, Bart defined all of God's revelation as an event in the person in the incarnation of Christ. So what he ended up saying is that the Bible only attests to this event in Christ. It is not actually the Word of God. It only becomes the Word of God when God chooses to. Well, that's very subjective. Um, and it's really tied heavily to the person's faith. So it's fideistic as well. I, I have huge problems. If you haven't gathered that, you know, from listening to me, I have huge problems with that kind of thinking. I don't believe that is biblical or correct. And so I don't want people to come away saying, I endorse Karl Barth, um, but I still think he has some interesting and good things to teach us, especially his, which is which is funny. He he demotes the Bible as the word of God in his doctrine of revelation, but he places so much emphasis on how the church needs to get back to the Bible for doing theology. Um, so if if you've never read anything by Karl Barth, he's he can be very very difficult. But this is a great little introduction to his thinking. It was actually the last book he wrote, based on lectures he gave at different. Um, seminaries and universities and their theological departments. Not a bad little book to read, 
You can get it pretty cheaply, I believe, but Evangelical Theology by Karl Barth. If you want to understand a theologian who is going to be remembered in history and is kind of outside the realm of normal normal evangelical theology, definitely Karl Barth. Another book that I think is great for historical perspective and understanding different movements of especially some ideas in Christianity that are being embraced today. Um, A Theology of Liberation by Gustavo Gutierrez. Now, I do not endorse almost, I I do not endorse almost anything in this book. Um, I think Gustavo is a heretic. I, I question if he's even a Christian. But liberation theology as a system of theology was highly influential for a while in the mid to later part of the 20th century. And I still see some of the ideas of liberation theology in our Christian circles today. That so much of the social justice movement today, it, they come from the same ideas because they're they're postmodern, they're dialectical, they're Marxist. Well, Gustavo's um, Gutierrez, his theology is it's postmodern to an extent, not completely, but to an extent, it is postmodern, it's dialectical, and it is also Marxist. <laughs> so it is, uh, I, there's almost nothing I endorse in the book. There, there are some things that made me think like, okay, I can, maybe I need to work on my perspective here with this. Maybe I have been too closed minded globally on a Christian view and, and I can appreciate things like that. But his, his entire theology is based on practice, based on how we act as Christians. It's not really a theology. It's more of a ideology, uh, more of a just anthropology. It's got a lot of problems. But if you want to understand how progressive Christians are thinking today, this is a good book to give you an introduction into that. because. Ideas don't die. They just kind of reincarnate a little differently in different generations. And a lot of the a lot of the ideas we're seeing from the progressive side of Christianity today, they're they're coming from liberation theology and the influences that fed into liberation theology. And then one final book, uh, The Journey of Modern Theology. I'm I'm wrapping up this class on modern theology. This is the text we read, um, The Journey of Modern Theology from Reconstruction to Deconstruction by Roger Olson. Great book. I, again, I don't agree with everything Olson says. His He tends to be more critical of fundamental or evangelical theologians and more forgiving and empathetic towards people who are clearly a heretical. If you really take what they're uh, reading and apply to the scriptures. They're just, they, I, I don't understand. I know that his influences come from more of that side. And so maybe that's, maybe that's where he's getting it from. But I mean, you just read the last chapter about postmodern or post-liberal theology. And he's, he is, you know, in the, in the chapter before. So the the second to last chapter, he talks a lot about Carl Henry who is kind of the father of evangelical theology in the 20th century. He's, he allows criticism to run through that chapter on Henry and, and really talks about how Henry failed to do this and that. And when you get to some of the postmodern and post-liberal theologians, he doesn't really talk about how they answered criticism. He talks about how, well, this was how so-and-so criticized this theologian. And if, this and if our post liberal theologian would have answered, it probably would have been like this. Well, that's just conjecture. That's not. That's not good writing. That's not good history, in, in my opinion. That's that's just your bias is showing through that. So, uh, even so, I think it's a great book for perspective on theology with over the last two hundred years. Um, you know, starting with Friedrich Schleiermacher, where liberal theology really gets a start, and we see it just a complete move away 
from centering theology in the person of God to centering theology in man and just what all the twists and turns theology takes in the last 200 years. This is a great book to become acquainted with that and really understand the major players. So those are the books I've read. So I mean, those aren't all the books I've read so far this year, but those are the ones that I really, uh, really suggest if you are really serious about learning in theology, I mean, those those will help you. So uh, that's all I got to talk about today. Sorry for going on a rant earlier today. I just I'm, I'm so I'm confused. I, I, I'm 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 just I'm baffled a bit. I, I don't know what to make of certain things, and so that's that's why I, I'm and and maybe I shouldn't have reacted like I did, but I just you know I I just don't understand where. Where is Christianity going in this country? I don't think it's going in the right place. It's not going in the right direction. You know, when everywhere else where revival is happening, like, you know, in Africa, they're calling out the Western world saying, you're caving. They're calling out the church in the Western world saying, you're caving to the world. You're caving to the whims and the politics of the world. While they're having miraculous conversions, miracles, and whatnot. And somehow we're supposed to think that we're more enlightened over here. What? I I just don't understand. I want to see revival. I want to see people come to Christ. And I, I, I think the church here in America is just shooting itself in the foot. So... That's all I got today. If you've listened up until now, thank you for listening. Uh, please subscribe or follow or whatever you need to do to continue to listen to me. Um, I'll keep challenging this stuff theologically, and I hope to you know bring you something again soon. God bless you. Keep learning. Let the Spirit illuminate you and what you are endeavoring, and just uh, pray for our churches, for our nation. God bless you.